John chapter 7, if you would please turn your Bibles there. John chapter 7. The reason why we're in John chapter 7 is because we're done with John chapter 6. That's the reason. And we've been done with John 6 for a little while, been in John 7. <coughs> this is uh, the chapter about the Feast of Tabernacles, where they tried to get Jesus, his brothers, tried to get Jesus to just push his way into the Feast of Tabernacles and say, Hi, I'm your Messiah, follow me, and I'll uh, take you out of Roman bondage. And I'll be your king and we'll slaughter all your enemies and we'll restore the kingdom and we'll put you on high above all the nations above the earth and, and so on and so on. But, and he is going to do that, by the way. He is going to do that. He just, just wasn't, he just wasn't for now. It's sort of like the difference between David and Solomon. I see David and Solomon as being types both of them types of the Lord Jesus. David was the warrior king who had to, to, had to destroy all of the enemies of the people of Israel. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So David destroys all the enemies. He's got blood on his hands from defeating all the kings, all the enemies, anybody who would dare come against Israel. He defeated all them, slaughtered all them. He, he made sure, he made arrangements during his kingdom uh, to gather the material for the temple, but he himself was not allowed to build the temple. So his son comes along. He's a picture of Christ's second coming. When Christ comes the second time, there's no need to defeat the enemies. They're already defeated. They just don't understand it. They don't know it yet. Satan doesn't know it yet. And even though he could be sitting in this room tonight as I say this and say the devil is defeated because of what Christ did on the cross and it would not, it would not makes sense to him whatsoever. He would not understand that. He does not believe that he is defeated. But he is. He already is. He's been defeated because of the cross of Calvary and so on. So Solomon represents the Christ of peace who comes to bring his kingdom to the earth. And, and nations literally during the kingdom of Solomon, we have Bible record plus historical records of kings from around the world coming to, they've heard of Solomon's kingdom. And they came from great distances to see how great his kingdom was and to bow down to him and to pay homage to him. In other words, pay him money and let Solomon know, hey, we're, we're your friends. We don't want any trouble from you. Don't kill us. Okay? So Solomon never, never really fought a battle during his reign. He's a picture of Christ during the thousand year reign. And, um, and he doesn't, he's not violent, doesn't have blood on his hands. Um, the fact, the, the idea of him having 700 wives, 300 concubines, a thousand women, that kind of gives me the idea that he represents Christ and his thousand year reign. And so, um, anyway, Christ here, they want him to go ahead and establish the kingdom. But he, Christ understands it's not time yet. My time is not yet. I've not come to establish this kingdom that you're speaking of. Not yet. When I come again, I'll do it. But right now, I've got enemies to kill. I've got sin to conquer. I've got debts to pay. And after that, after I'm given this new body, then, then I can be the king. So, um, 
Let's pick it up in uh, John chapter 7, verse 20. Uh, the Bible says, The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. So he's caught them in a trap. They're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath day. And yet, if the Sabbath day falls on the eighth day after the birth of a child, the law requires that that child be circumcised on that day. So can they do that work on the Sabbath day? Well, obviously, yes. Jesus made a point at a, at a different time. Which one of you who had an ox down in a pit would not go straight away, and tie a rope onto that ox and try to get him out of that pit? You do your milking on the Sabbath day. You do necessary things on the Sabbath day. So don't tell me that it's wrong for me to heal people or to do good on the Sabbath day. Don't tell me that. Because you do it all the time, you hypocrites. I, he, Jesus, uh, verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Verse 23, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us here tonight. All of those that are gathered here, all of those, Lord, that are gathered with us online, we thank you for them. We pray, dear God, that, uh, Lord, anything I say tonight, I, I don't feel, Lord, tonight I don't feel like I can be a blessing to anybody. It's just how I feel. I don't feel like I have anything to say. I don't feel like I have anything to give. Father, if it was left up to me, I'd close her up and just go on home and go to bed. But Father, you've gathered us here tonight. You have us here for a reason. And I pray, Father, Lord, that something I say, something that comes out of me through the Holy Spirit, God, would end up being a blessing to somebody in their life. So, Father, use me. I always tell you, Lord, that you, you can use my best efforts. Lord, I would ask, God, that you use my worst efforts as well. So, Lord, you get the honor and you get the praise and you get the glory. And I'd rather have it that way anyway. So, Father, while it may not have been the, the best, best day I've had so far, I do thank you for the day. Thank you for the work that you've allowed me to do. I pray, God, that you would bless it for your purpose, for your kingdom and your glory. Lord, just open our eyes to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, Jesus brings up this issue of circumcision. Circumcision, of course, as we all know, is the cutting off of a portion of the flesh, the foreskin, and casting it off. It is wounding a, a child is what it's doing. It's wounding a child, removing a part of his flesh and casting it away. And here is Jesus doing the exact opposite on the Sabbath day instead of wounding a man and removing part of his flesh 
He is making a man whole on the Sabbath day. So Jesus asked the le legitimate question, which is better to do on the Sabbath day? Wound a child through circumcision, which was given to you by Moses, and is part of the law, goes even predates Moses, goes all the way back to Abraham. So which is, which is better for you to wound a child on the Sabbath day or to make a man whole on the Sabbath day and completely heal him and, and make him whole? Which is better? They had never, they had never thought about that question before. It had never entered into their mind. And Jesus came down here on this earth to, to teach us things that would have never crossed our mind had Jesus not said them. And that's what the Bible's for. It's to tell us, anybody who says I'm a Christian, but I, I just don't read my Bible much, I don't think I have to because I'm just full of the Spirit anyway. I, no, I think you're full of baloney, but I don't think you're full of the Spirit. Because there's all kinds of things in this book that will make you think things that you would have never thought before a day in your life. That's what this Bible is here for, is to make you think in a different way. And Jesus was doing that just now. So he's rubbing, rubbing this in to them and saying, which is better, that you make a, a, a child wounded on the Sabbath day, according to the law of Moses, or that I make a man whole on the Sabbath day, according to my love for this man, which is better to do on the Sabbath day? Which one, which, which one is, the, is the greater thing to do on the Sabbath day? He said, I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Judge not according to appearance. But judge righteous judgment. Don't judge people because of what you see out of them right now. Don't judge by the appearance that you look upon them now. God may straighten them out, turn them into some kind of amazing person for God and you judged them and hated them and despised them and didn't want anything to do with them and Jesus says don't do that don't judge somebody out of their appearance or what from what you can see on that day but judge righteous judgment In verse 25 then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? In other words, do, do not the rulers know do, do, they, do they believe that this man is the Messiah? That he's the, the real deal? That he is the Christ? Uh, verse 27, How be it we know this man whence he is. But when Christ... See, they had already judged him. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and know whence I am. And I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true. Whom ye know not. Now who sent Jesus? God. And what is Jesus saying now to them? You don't know God. And that, understandably, made them just a little angry. 
a little upset. We're the Jews. We're the Jewish scholars. We read the Torah. We read the, the traditions of our fathers, the Babylonian Talmud. We read all these other books. We, how dare you say we don't know who God is? Jesus is going to double down on that statement. I'm telling you, you really don't know who God is. If you knew who God was, you would accept me. But since you don't accept me, that tells me that you don't even know who God is. Um, verse 29, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Faces and ears turning red as they hear him say this. Blood pressures going up. Breathing increasing. We're going to kill this guy. If it's the last thing we do, we're going to kill him. He's saying that God himself sent him. How I'm sick of this guy. I don't want to hear no more of this nonsense. If I had, if I had it my way, I'd kill him. Why don't you kill him right now? Why don't you get up and kill him right now? Because God wouldn't let him. That's exactly why God wouldn't let him. He wasn't meant to die at the hand of somebody that was mad at him. He was meant to die on the cross and only on the cross to give his life. So verse 30, then they sought to take him, but no man, laid his, no man laid hands on him. Why? Because his hour was not yet come. Now, my brothers and sisters, if I could teach you anything as a, as a life lesson, if I could teach you something that would give you fulfillment, happiness, joy, peace, everything good from God, it would be this one thing that God is going to do you good all the time. But he is going to do it in his time and not your time. Amen. I've been praying all day. God, get me out of this mood I'm in. No, hadn't happened yet. I'm still in it. I don't understand it. I don't like it. What I want to do is close my Bible up. Let's have our prayer. And I want to go home. That's, that's just how I feel. God has a joy for me. That he's going to give me. And I'm willing to wait on it. I'm willing to wait on it. I don't want to wait on it. But I'm willing to wait on it. Because when it comes, I know it's going to come from God. He's going to deliver it to me. And there ain't a devil in this world that can stop the joy of the Lord from coming to me. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So tonight I feel, I feel very weak. I feel very vulnerable. And I don't like that feeling. I just don't like that feeling at all. But if I could, if I could teach you one thing that will help you and give you understanding of how God works, 
it would be the hour is not yet come. It's not time for you to be happy. It's not time for you to be blessed. It's not time for you to receive this. It's not time for you to receive that. I've been through these issues before. Back in the days when I wanted, I wanted so bad to get out of working in construction and get into the ministry. I wanted that. For a while, while I was in construction, I was the complete opposite. I didn't really want anything to do with the ministry. But then God began to burden me and lay a burden on me that was so heavy. And I will tell you, and this is what I was telling some of the men that I counseled with during that time. I would tell them, here's what I'm hearing from God. God is saying, Mike, if you don't start seeking my will, you're not going to live. And I said, now, I don't know what that means, but I don't like the sound of it. So I need to find out what God wants me to be doing right now. And the men that I went to were very supportive. One of them was my former pastor, preacher, golf Another one was Ron Dagonia, who I was working for at the time. He was very supportive of me because he saw in me his own life years ago where God had called him into the ministry as a young man. But he put God off on the back burner and just lived. He lived a horrible life after that. Until God busted him into a thousand pieces. But anyway, um. If I could preach to you anything and cause you to understand anything is that what God does, he does in his own time. And he's good at it. He's good at that timing. He's really good at that timing. So he says, verse 31, and many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. In other words, let's let's round him up. Let's arrest him. Let's do it right now. Verse 33, then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while am I with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Why? Because he was going to be standing at the right hand of the father. Now, who knows how to get there? What spaceship have we built yet that knows how to get there? I ought to, I won't. I ought to tell you a little bit about some things I've been reading about the technology that supposedly we have. But I won't. But it's technology that if it's true that we have this technology, we literally have the ability right now to fold the universe. You know what that means? Let's say here's Earth and here is a galaxy with a, with a, with a sun, a, a solar system on it and a planet that we think has life on it. Now traveling from A to B would take us a hundred million light years. But on Star Trek, they, they had what's called a warp drive, meaning they had the ability to warp space and time. And just, just this is how it literally works. Now, how far away is the other planet? 
It's like right next to us, isn't it? You say, well, that's all baloney. Did you know that the Bible says that when God comes down, he'll bow the heavens? He'll bend heaven to come down here. Just like this. And there's, there is reason to believe that we are working on that science or already have it. The ability to fold and bend space and time. The, they call the fabric of the universe. What did Elijah hold in his hand as he crossed, before he crossed the river Jordan on his way to be translated into heaven? Huh? A mantle, which is a, which is a, it's a fabric. And he folded it and was able to cross the river Jordan and then he was translated. Okay? It's, it's all right in the Bible. Everything that they've dreamed up, God's already written it down in here. Okay? God's going to fold. God said he's going to roll the heavens up like a scroll. Anyway. Yeah, amen. But we don't know how to we don't know where heaven is. We don't know how to get there. We we actually don't know how yet where the end, how to get to the edge of the universe because we don't know how far out it is. Um where was I? Verse 34, ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Well, he did do that through the Holy Spirit in the Bible. What manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and ye shall not find me, and whither I am, thither ye cannot come? Well, what manner of speech that was, was he was telling them, when I leave out of here, you will not be able to follow me where I'm going because I'm going to my father's house and you do not know where he lives. You cannot get there. Not with a million starships can you get there. You won't be able to find it. I'll put it so far out of reach, you'll never be able to get there. And that's what he meant by that. Now verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, this is the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 now identifies what that river of living water is. But this he this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now you had a few people in the Old Testament unto whom the Holy Spirit was given to them. Some people make a statement say, well, the Holy Spirit was on them, but not in them. The Bible disagrees with that. The scriptures disagree, blatantly disagree with that. The Spirit was in them. Okay? 
And I can prove that to you with scripture. Um, but, but clearly, it wasn't poured out into every man who believed. It, was, it wasn't done that way. But once the day of Pentecost came around, all of those who believed, when they were, when on the day of Pentecost, the 120 in, in, the, um, in the upper room, plus by the end of the day, the 3,000 that were saved, they received the Holy Spirit in them. And I, I use that illustration of a baby. And the first thing that a baby does when it is born is what? <gasps> breathe. It can't cry until it breathes. Has no air in its lungs. It wasn't breathing in the womb. And this is why, this is reason 3,212 why I believe the Holy Ghost comes at salvation is that at birth, the breath comes at birth. You can't have a child be born and it not breathe but be alive for six or eight months and then it gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. That is not, that's not how it happens. The Bible gives us a just a, a, a common sense revelation concerning this. So he said, rivers of, uh, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he, this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. A uh, couple verses I want to read to you. Jeremiah 2.13 for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Now we know the, the living waters is, number one, the Holy Spirit, and number two, the Bible. We know that's what it is. The, and God said the people have committed these two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, number one, and number two, they've hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You know what that means? They translated their own Bibles. They wrote their own Bibles. They wrote their own doctrine. And those Bibles cannot hold the living waters. They cannot contain the living waters and the living waters leak out of those Bibles and there is no living waters in those Bibles. Therefore, there is no life in those Bibles. Amen. Jesus said, my people have committed two evils. Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Who's the fountain of living waters? The Lord himself. Who is the Lord himself? The word of God. Who is the word of God? The Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of Christ. What is the Spirit of Christ? The Spirit of crying, Abba, Father. It all, it's all... The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, they're all three one. And um, all that forsake, forsake thee, and that they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. And this is what I think Jesus was doing when they brought the woman in adultery to him. I think Jesus was writing the names of those who had forsaken him. In the earth. That makes sense to me. All that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. 
So they bring the woman caught in adultery and Jesus just looks at them and he just starts writing their names down in the dirt. Because they had forsaken Jesus. Zechariah 14, 8. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. This is during the thousand year reign. In that day shall, shall there be one Lord, and his name is what? What's his name? One. That's a funny name, isn't it? But I and my father are. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are. One. And I saw a throne, and he. And there was one sitting on the throne. One. Not some one. A determined, identified, known one. God is one, is he not? Amen. Yet he is three. Can we reconcile that in our minds? No. Can we believe it? Yes. We can believe it. Amen to that. So the, the fountain of living waters coming out of the throne of God is proceeding from God himself through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through the Father, whose name is one. You forsake that living water and it's in the form of the Bible. When you forsake that living water, you've hewn out cisterns for yourself that don't hold water. We used to have a cistern when I was growing up outside our house, just off of Telegraph Road up here. Now, I didn't know what it was for, but I knew when the water guy came and put water in it, and if he wouldn't close the lid all the way, I could see water down in there. And I would always drop rocks down in there. I, I didn't know what, I didn't know what it was, I thought it was cool, I could drop rocks down in there and hear him go, the blink. But he used to leave that open, and my mom got on to him, she said, you quit leaving that, the top open. My boy plays out there and one of these days he's going to fall in there. And I don't remember this, but she looked outside one time and there I am with my head stuck way down in that, down in that cistern. And she come out and snuck up behind me real quiet as not to startle me and grab me by the seat of my pants and yank me up so as I wouldn't fall down in there. And then she really got on to the guy. So anyway. <laughs> 